Are you tired of the same routine of studying the Bible? We thought so too. That's why we came up with Random Acts of Study, where we open the Bible and we find out where God wants us to be. I'm Aaron, your host. And I'm Josh. The Bible. You know of it. We know of it. But how well do we understand it? Hopefully a lot better after this. Hope so. So, last, well, two weeks ago, we did uh, a random poll of Scripture, and we, we came up with Hosea 8, uh, 1 through 7. And uh, after a lot of, of research and cross-referencing and, and talking, you know, sharing notes back and forth, I think Josh and I are in a very good position to hopefully speak on what it means. Yes. Yes, I think we are. So, um, you just want to walk through this maybe uh, verse by verse? Yeah, so we could actually go in right now and we'll just reread, if you'd like, just quickly. Okay. And uh, that way, you know, people tuning in for the first time can hear what we, uh, hear what we read. Okay, so in Hosea chapter 8, we're going to be in verses 1 to 7. So starting in verse 1. Put the trumpet to your lips. Like an eagle, the enemy comes against the house of the Lord. Because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. They cry out to me, my God, we of Israel know you. Israel has rejected the good. The enemy will pursue him. They have set up kings, but not by me. They have appointed princes, but I did not know it. With their silver and gold, they have made idols for themselves that they might be cut off. He has rejected your calf, O Samaria, saying, My anger burns against them. How long will they be incapable of innocence? For from Israel is even this. A craftsman made it, so it is not God. Surely the calf of Samaria will be broken to pieces, for they sow the wind and they reap the whirlwind. The standing grain has no heads. It yields no grain. Should it yield, strangers would swallow it up. So... That was our passage that we were led to read uh, a couple of weeks ago. So, you know, at, at, at first glance, it seems like it's a pretty simplistic prophecy. It seems like uh, pretty much everything else that we've read, you know, throughout the entirety of, you know, chapters one through seven of, of Hosea, it is, it's not looking good uh, for Israel. And, you know, eight doesn't really change the script or the narrative that much, you know, from what I can tell. No, it looks pretty bleak for them. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, we're, <laughs> we sound like sportscasters right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, they got the ball, but it's not looking good. Yes. Um, so you know, do, do you want to enter into your notes first, and then um, you sure. know what, what we'll do is we'll, we'll kind of bounce back and forth, not in a ping pong manner. Uh, we'll kind of build it uh, in a stair step. So I'll pull up um, uh, Josh's notes. Or we'll have some more technical difficulties. So for now, we're actually just going to read these notes. You got it. I can handle that. So first, it starts off with, put the trumpet to your lips. And literally, this translates to your palate of shofar. Uh, God is telling Hosea, let your voice be heard and call like a shofar. Now, a shofar is, uh, that's the ram's horn uh, that God used to to assemble, or or Israel used to assemble God's people on, on feast days. They would use it at Rosh Hashanah. Um, Yom Kippur, it was also used to call troops to battle. So the, the sounding of the shofar is a calling of the people. Um, and, and the call here is the Assyrians are coming like an eagle. Uh, and then God gives the reason, because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. Uh, and we see the reason for this calamity coming upon Israel, um, the northern kingdom here. And uh, just as is told in Deuteronomy 31, 16 to 8, uh, literally, as um, Moses is uh, getting ready to die before the the, the, the uh, children of Israel come into the Holy Land, uh, God says to him, the Lord says to Moses, Behold, you are about to lie down with your fathers, and this people will arise and play the harlot with the strange gods of the land, and in the midst of which they are going, and will forsake me and break my covenant, which I have made with them. Then my anger will be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them and hide my face from them, 
and they will be consumed, and many evils and troubles will come upon them, so that they will say in this day, Is it not because our God is not among us that these evils have come upon us? But I will surely hide my face in that day because of all the evil which they will do, for they will turn to other gods. Uh, and then also Solomon in Second uh, Chronicles chapter 6, uh, as he's praying and as he's dedicating the temple, uh, right in the middle of his prayer, uh, we see this in verse 36. When they sin against you, for there is no man, man who does not sin, and you are angry with them and deliver them to an enemy so that they take them away captive to a land far off or near. Um, so this is just God fulfilling the promises that he made through Moses, and, and even Solomon recognizes in his prayer of dedication at the temple. What I, what I found really uh, interesting looking at the various different translations and you know going uh, into the Hebrew and like looking up eagle uh, being an unclean bird uh, thinking about you know the priesthood um, you know an, an unclean animal is is about to land on the house of the Lord which at that point was really a, about the temple of meeting right so right. you know what would the priest be doing if they were you know seeing this animal about to land on a holy place is they would be doing everything in their power to try to get this thing either off of it or not to land off of it. So they'd be, they'd be blowing horns. They'd be, you know, waving sheets. They'd be going crazy trying to keep this thing away. Um, you know, so that's kind of, you know, a, a, a picture that I had in my head, you know, during reading that after looking at the Hebrew, um, my notes on, on verse one, um, you know, put the trumpet to your lips. And I, I broke down sentence structure. Josh is uh, a trained teacher, so mine is more uh, in a study fashion, and, and his is more in uh, how to teach. Uh, so breaking down the sentence, you know, pay attention and be very afraid. And you know, put the trumpet to your lips. Plead with your family and friends so they listen closely to Hosea's warning. Uh, because the Assyrian army is soon to invade and enslave, kill and scatter that's where the eagle comes in and uh, comes against the house of the Lord, which is the Israelite people. They have transgressed my covenant. So they've, they've forgotten the responsibility to God and his promise to them. You know, uh, they've rebelled against his law, which means they stopped following his rules and decrees as evidence of their salvation, instead following pagan deities and rituals. Uh, falling away from God, you know, very similar to what we today can do, you know, when we're not, um, when we're not studying, you know, when we're not devoting our life to God. Uh, that, you know, I, I would consider that the warning, uh, entering into the hollow plea. They cry out to me, my God, we of Israel know you. But like Josh's note said, God has deafened his ears against Israel's worship because they insist on their way rather than God's way. Uh, we actually talked about that in, in life group this morning is um, trust, faith, belief that no matter what, God's going to answer your prayer, but he may not answer it in the way that you want it to. So that's, again, applicable for you know, today's life. Uh, do you want me to go on to next note? Are you done through verse 2, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I'll pick up verse 2. I said, they cry out to me. So when evil befalls them, uh, this is their default position, uh, crying out to God. And they say, my God, we of Israel know you. Um, there's, you know, are we not your people? Uh, but God will not heed them, because right here leading to verse 3, Israel has rejected the good. Um, or as some, as you study this, uh, looking through some Jewish sources and such, um, they translate instead of the good here as the good one. So Israel has rejected the good, uh, but the good coming from the good one, they, they rejected God. So the enemy will pursue them. Uh, it's just laid out here in verse three. So uh, back to you. So yeah, looking at looking at verse three, I, I pretty much mimicked exactly what you said. You know, Israel has rejected the good. The enemy will pursue him. Uh, Israel has thrown aside God's way for the ways of the world. And the only way is God's way. It's the good path. 
and those that stray from it will be punished. That's the the harsh reality. Uh, but he's our creator. He will correct us when he needs to. And uh, we'll see later on, we'll talk about redemption. Yes. Uh, so I'll, I'll continue on into verse four, I think. Yep, go ahead. So they have set up kings, but not by me. So uh, at that point in time, you know, you, you had uh, kings not of the Davidic line, uh, which is important as we point towards the Messiah. Um, they've been brought to power by the Israelites without consulting their God. This leads to a period of time of assassination and self-appointed kings. Uh, you had uh, some of them that wouldn't even last a year, a um, couple months, you know, something like that. And these people, because they weren't approved by God, they didn't have the Israelites' uh, best interest at heart. And, and that's a major problem. You know, you're electing individuals that don't have your don't have a love for you. They, they want the power. They want uh, the control. Uh, so they've appointed princes, but I did not know it. And you look at, uh, you know, God, an all-knowing being, is stating, you know, but I did not know it. He's not saying he didn't know. What he's saying is that he did not approve. He didn't adore, endorse these people. So um, their leadership choices, their, their politicians that they were bringing in, they weren't followers of Israel's God, um, you know, our God. They were appointed to uh, oversee them in a way that uh, would not lead them down the correct path. And, and that alone is, uh, for my notes, it's a stronger insult to God than most things. Um, with their silver and gold, they have made idols for themselves. So the Israelite people had been blessed. Multitudes of riches. Uh, we saw that in, in some of their conquests. And, you know, they were very wealthy. Uh, they used their, their wealth and riches that God blessed them with and essentially melted it down and created idols. And those idols were to worship God. You had Baal. You had uh, fertility uh, rituals and, and wealth rituals and, and things like that. And they were, they were taken and making graven Im- images, which uh, we've already learned from uh, you know, the first pre- priesthood, Aaron, while Moses was up on a mountain, he created something that he shouldn't have. And guess what happened to that? Um, and it says then, it finishes up that they might be cut off, uh, which means now they're at risk of losing everything he, God, has given them. Uh, and I would call that their transgression. Uh, yeah, Good looking here in, in verse 4, they have set up kings, they have appointed princes, um, God saying that Israel here is, is choosing uh, their own leaders with, without the direction of God. Um, they're choosing who they think is best, but they're, they're not consulting God in this decision-making. Um, they're relying upon their own wisdom. Um, and, and, and God's saying, but not by me, and but I did not know it. Um, and the know here has the idea of acknowledge. Uh, he's not saying that he, he didn't know, he didn't acknowledge their, their princes, their kings that they set up. Um, and they have made idols for themselves. And we see here the rebuke here is going from the political to the religious. First, he's condemning their their appointing of kings and princes and who's going to rule them without consulting him. Um, and now they've made idols to worship. Uh, and and this, this appointing of kings and, and leaders that are not uh, approved by God, God's not consulted on that, uh, it leads to uh, religious uh, ramifications here. Um, and we, we see the, these first calves were set up in the northern kingdom uh, by Jeroboam I, their first king. Uh, he sets one up in Dan in the north and one in Bethel in the, in the south, uh, making it easier for the people. And, and instead of going to the temple every year at the, at the feasts that are required, now they can just they can go to whatever's closer and they make it easier. And, uh, and, the, and the idea here at first, at least, is that they're worshiping Yahweh. They're worshiping a representation of Yahweh. And they're making a golden calf because God says, don't make an image of me. So they're making an image of something else that represents God or Yahweh to them. And then they can still worship Yahweh. You just don't have to go to the temple. You can just do that here. Uh, but verse 5 is really clear. He has rejected your calf. And, and I love here that literally this is your calf stinks. Basically, your, your calf smells like manure. 
God has rejected the worship of the golden calf. And, and as a result of the worship of their calf, God's anger burns against them. Um, and then the verse finishes up, verse 5. How long will they be incapable of innocence? Hosea sounds a frustrated here. How long will they ignore what God says and keep doing things their way? And, and, and instead of just following what God has laid out for them, you know, how long are they going to continue in this? How many times have we as dads looked at our children and said, dude, come on. Well, I don't say dude because I only have girls. Okay. Well, yeah, fair. <laughs> dude, dude is, is it's a neutral term. <laughs> all right. All right. Anybody can be a dude. Um, yeah, go, going going to five for myself. I, I consider this the decision. Uh, he has rejected your calf, O Samaria. Um, you know, my my notes mimic yours pretty much. You know, King Jeroboam has set up two golden calves to represent God, um, and you know, I put in in notes here. Uh, ultimately, also Baal. Correct me if I'm wrong. And it's okay to. Yeah, I think no. I don't necessarily think that the calves represent Baal at least at this point or early into it. Uh, they may have done it, but Baal worship is usually associated with Ashereth, uh, and it gets a little sexual in nature. So, but they might they might have uh, eventually. Done it. Oh, Baal's also the word for Lord, so they can confuse the two sometimes too. So, that's why you're here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I noted you know one near northern and, and the south, um, and it was to prevent the Israelites from traveling up to Jerusalem to worship. Um, saying my anger burns against them. Uh, like the golden calf of Aaron, God refuses to be made into a worldly image. The audacity of the Israelites to worship God in any way other than how he commanded enrages him against them. Um, there's not really a better way to put my anger burns. Like That's frightening stuff. And, and actually, this is language you heard when we went back to um, Deuteronomy and... Second Chronicles there, he talked about his anger burning against them in similar, similar language. Yeah. Uh, how long will they be incapable of innocence? And, and to me, you know, I, I wrote down um, the emotions of God. Uh, God is as sorrowful as he is angry. You can sense his sadness as he likely reflects on how many times his people have fallen away from him. And that, I mean, that's just depressing to think about, you know, um, causing your creator, causing your God to be sad. It's such a, a human emotion. Um, going into the frustration part, uh, which is verse 6 for me, um, for from Israel is even this. And there's there's broken sentence structure here. Uh, so I'll, I'll continue to read from, uh, for, for from Israel is even this, a craftsman has made it, or a craftsman made it, so it is not God. Surely the calf of Samaria will be broken to pieces. And this is uh, Hosea uh, actually speaking this. Um, and it, it, the broken sentence structure shows how frustrated Hosea is right now. And you can almost picture him emoting at one of the statues and saying, really, guys, come on. What are you doing? And uh, again, recalling uh, Aaron's calf idol he created, uh, which I already spoke about, um, Hosea's promising that these idols will be melted down into something more valuable, which uh, valuable by the creator standards, not worldly standards. Yeah. In, in verse six, I've got it pretty much. He's making three points here, you know, for, from Israel is even this. So this idols from Israel. So it's not God. Uh, it was made. He's talking about craftsmen making it. So it's not God. And since it's not God, it'll be broken to pieces. It, it's not going to last. Yahweh will last, but this golden calf, or calves here, they're, they're not going to last. When the enemy comes, he's going to take them. He's going to literally break them up to pieces. Um, I believe the Hebrew almost talked like splinters, like wood being ripped apart. Um, and it'll be something much more valuable to those um, coming to conquer the land. And it says, they sow the wind and reap the whirlwind. To Israel, it seem that the judgment they're going to receive will be worse than the sin they committed. And often when we face God's judgment, this is, this is what we think of. Um, and it's not true in the sense of God being worse to them than their sin deserved. But it is true in how judgment feels. Um, 
and this is because uh, it, 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 we're starting to get the application point of view, I think, so as we're wrapping up. Yeah. Uh, we're going to use Israel as an example. This was something they had sown over a long period of time. And the same thing in our sin. When we're dealing with sin and we're walking in it, oftentimes um, it's done over a long period of time, but it, the, it's reaped in a much briefer period of judgment. Our, our, our sin um, and our judgment comes in a, a much quicker fashion um, than the, the time of sin we took to reap it. Um, and then he says, the standing grain has no heads. So they're not going to prosper in their deeds. What they do is not going to be prosperous. Um, they can try, but it won't. And and then should it yield, strangers will swallow it up. So even if they are to prosper, it's going to fall into the hands of strangers. It won't be for their benefit. It'll be for somebody else's benefit. So they might think, hmm, yeah, you said we wouldn't prosper, but look, we are prospering. But that the 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 um, the bounty that comes from that is not going to be theirs. It will soon be the Assyrians. Right. Um, I'll, I'll quickly go over mine. Uh, for they, they sow the wind and they reap the whirlwind. Uh, though this passage is literal, um, because they will experience, the Israelites will experience famine and theft of goods, uh, the overarching lesson is timeless. And this, like, like Josh said, is going into the uh, present-day application for this scripture. In our spiritual immaturity, we spend less time investing in things that will grow into a great harvest. Um, even Jesus mentions it, mm-hmm. you know, where, where the, the grains scatter in different areas and how they grow and, and what happens to them. And should it yield, strangers would swallow it up. So even if it does grow, you're not going to get to benefit off of it, or they are not going to get to benefit off of it which is a warning against false Christianity and, and lukewarm faith, in my mind. That's how I would apply it. Um, so I think we're, we're down to the actual application of things. I, I call this my lesson portion of, uh, of the verse. Okay, so as, as we look at these seven verses, we say, how do we apply these to our lives? Because um, we're not the northern kingdom of Israel, if you haven't noticed, because um, they're not around anymore. And so, so how do we bring application to our lives? And I think first is uh, don't try to serve or worship God in your own way. Um, I think in, in culture, a lot of times people are trying to do what they want. They want to worship God how they want to worship God. Uh, they, they think they can take what it is that makes them happy and just throw Christ in front of it. And I'm going to worship God this way. Uh, but take the Word of God seriously and let it be your guide in serving and worshiping God. Uh, everything we do, hold it up to this. Hold it up to the Word of God. How does it meet this standard? Uh, am I compromising or, or am I lifting up God? So, And then I would say, look at verse 10. Uh, and, and really, I'm just looking at one, one, one phrase there. Now I will gather them up. Right? It starts with, even though they hire allies among the nations, uh, now that they hire, and he says, now we'll gather them up. So, uh, yes, judgment was coming. The Assyrians were coming, and that judgment was coming upon Israel. But when the time is right, God will gather his people back. God does not abandon us in judgment. It's to get our attention and to get our focus back on him. If you continue on reading in those passages in Deuteronomy and uh, Second Kings, it talks about, when they're in a foreign land and they call out to you, then you will bring them back. The purpose of God's judgment here is to get their attention. Uh, it's not just to bring calamity. It's not to destroy everything. It's to get their focus back on him where it should have been the whole time. I honestly don't really have much to add to that. And it's, just, it's the truth. Mm-hmm. Um, hold everything up to what the Bible says. Yes. Uh, what God's word has said. And uh, the application is always going to be true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, let this be our standard. Let this be our guide, the word of God. So with that, that wraps up uh, chapter 8. That wraps up, well, not chapter 8, but our first, well, that wraps up our first random act of study. That's not bad. So... Well, we'll we'll take like a a couple seconds and uh, close the word. Yeah. Okay.
And then uh, here we go. So you'll be the one uh, doing the polling, and I'll, I'll be the reading. All right. Let's see what we can get here. Um, I see, I, I actually, I see Acts uh, 16, verse 31. Uh, and it looks like it goes all the way through, you know, 40 with, with the breaks that were added uh, by scribes and, and amazing uh, editors isn't the right word, but uh, <laughs> it makes it a little bit easier to digest. Okay. Uh, so it's about the, uh, the jailer uh, being converted. Uh, so Acts 16.24, I'm going to pull that up in Logos. That way we can all read it together. No, 31. Uh, is it Acts 16.31? Yeah. What did I say? 24. <laughs> 31 through 40. <laughs> All right. Yeah, there we go. So the jailer converted. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. That might actually be enough. Or should I, do you want to continue on? Yeah, continue on. All right. So verse 35 continues. Now when the day, when day came, the chief magistrates sent their policemen saying, release those men. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The chief magistrates have sent to release you. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us in public without trial, men who are Romans and have thrown us into prison. And now they are sending us away secretly? No, indeed. But let them come themselves and bring us out. The policemen reported these words to the chief magistrates. They were afraid when they heard that they were Romans, and they came and appealed to them. And when they had brought them out, they kept begging them to leave the city. They went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. All right, so what we're seeing here is literally coming out of the birth of the church in Philippi. Paul and Silas, that's who we and they are. Uh, have been thrown in jail. They've been beaten. Uh, and they have not stood trial as they should. They are both Roman citizens, so you cannot beat them and throw them in jail without a trial. And as they're sitting in, in, in prison, and this is in the verses before, they're singing. They're, they're having a testimony, and there's an earthquake. Uh, and when the jailer arrives, he's ready to kill himself because under Roman law, if someone a prisoner escapes, then you take their their penalty. Uh, and Paul called, cries out to them, and, and you know we're all here, we're still here. And so this is where it picks up. He wants to know, uh, sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's the verse before, and that's the setup for this. Really, and we see is is they tell him, just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Now this isn't teaching household salvation where. Um, the father is, is saved, the whole family will be saved. But this is in, in an Eastern culture where the father, uh, what decision he makes, the, the household is going to follow. Uh, I lived in Africa for a few years, and I, I've seen this demonstrated. I remember one night uh, or one day we were doing some hut-to-hut evangelism uh, amongst the, the Maasai, and our interpreter takes us in, and the, the, the man was gone, but his two wives were there. Um, and, and one of the wives had just given birth uh, the, the day before. She was the midwife, so that's why she wanted us to talk to them. And was, we're, we're speaking with them, and um, they, well, we'll wait for our husband to get home. And No, this is a decision you have to make. But So the, the, the idea is what the husband decides, this is what the family will follow. Uh, and in that case, his wives got to be um, the witness to him, and, uh, they, and he, followed, he followed them in, in, in believing in Jesus. So what they're saying is, 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 is to be saved, you, you got to believe in Jesus. you, you got to put your faith and your, your loyalty to Jesus above, above all else. 
uh, and and basically he takes him into the house. He, they they wash the wounds. Um, everybody gets baptized that night. There's great rejoicing, uh, and that's where you want to end it because that's like a high note. But I want to keep going because I know that the, this sets up the birth of the church at Philippi. So we'll see some interesting stuff when we come back in a couple of weeks. I'm sure. Yeah, I, I was about to say, looking at uh, one thing the Romans hated was large groups of people that could cause riots and problems. And uh, Paul wasn't exactly the most, uh, self-admittedly, the the most outspoken uh, verbally, you know, in person, person. And this did lead, from the, the, a riot the day before was leading up to what all happened here. Yeah, and they, so. they, didn't, they didn't ask for clarification, uh, you know, what citizen are you or who are you? Precisely, it's oh, you're you're causing trouble. We're going to we're going to smack fix it. you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're going to put you in stocks. Yep. Uh, so it was it was immediate. Um, I, I like the last part. They encouraged them and then left. So, I. Uh, I oh, like you're that. down already in verse forty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. I stopped in verse thirty-four. Yeah. Oh, I kept on going to forty, yeah. but uh, so yeah, uh, we'll be doing. Acts 16, 31 through 40 is where I stopped off at. So uh, all about the jailer converted. So be sure to study. That's important. Yes, it is. So we will be back in two weeks with uh, following this up. And uh, we'll have some answers and uh, a lot more notes, a lot more studying to do. Yeah, I'm excited for it. Uh, So as always, Go on to the Facebook group. That's where a lot of you are going to be finding this live. Um, you know, we are going to eventually begin putting out uh, audio podcast versions of this that are going to be split into two separate things. So the reading that we just had a few moments ago, that will be split off into uh, its its own little thing. That way it's easier to digest. It's easier to uh, keep things on track with uh, subject matter. And... Uh, Post, make comments, ask questions. You know, we we are uh, we're fellow studiers of the word. Um, you know, we're we're various different uh, levels of, uh, I guess, study uh, yeah. and knowledge. And if we ever come across something in one of these passages that you got a question for, definitely post that in the in the comments, and we'll try to address it. Absolutely. Uh, so, with that being said, I guess we'll we'll close out in a quick word of prayer. Uh, you know, we have read the Word of God today, and that is a, a holy thing. Yes. So, uh, Josh, would you sure like to do it? Yeah, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day you've given us, Lord. We thank you uh, even for the, the problems that we had beginning of the show, Lord, and it wasn't until we took a moment to notice you, Father, and to acknowledge you uh, that you fixed the problem, Lord. And it's the same thing in our lives, Father, as we go out from here, Lord, we may just the people listening, Father, uh, the people involved here, Lord, as as we go, may we be encouraged to study your word more, to make it a part of a a regular um, part of our lives so that we grow in our knowledge of you, we grow in our relationship with you, and we come to know you more, Father. We come to know you closer in in a better relationship. pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. That concludes episode two. All right. Happy days. And we'll play the, uh, the little outro music. It's the same as the intro music, but it just sounds really cool. All right, guys. We'll see you soon. See you next time.